Okay, we're back. We're live. Here it is on a Monday, February 3rd, as a matter of fact. Think Tech Talks and the SOWEST Hour, standing for one of my favorite acronyms, the School of Ocean, Earth, Science, and Technology at UH Manoa, uh, with um, Mark Giles. Martin. Martin Giles. Mark. Martin. Martin. Mark. Martin. Martin Giles. <laughs> <laughs> He's got me going on his name. Yeah. He's a Norman, good. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's a you know place in what, France. That's <laughs> right. Norman D. And uh Kwok Phi Chung. Uh, but he goes by Phi. And uh, Martin is a uh, let's see, I'm gonna do this right. Uh, senior physical oceanographic research specialist at SOS. And Phi is a professor of ocean and research. Uh, engineering. Resource. Resource. <laughs> oh, resource engineering. Ocean mm -hmm. and resource engineering. Okay, and uh, you know, the good part is that I get to ask you what all that means mm -hmm. and um, you know, what, exactly what your efforts are directed at. So we're, we're going to talk today, we styled this show High Resolution Forecast with Pac Ayus. And I think that's the right pronunciation because I learned quick. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's it. Mm -hmm. And PAC I use is spelled P A C I O O S. And uh, I O O S is an acronym for Integrated Ocean Ob Observing Systems. Right? Right. That's okay, we'll correct. explore that today. Uh, and it's about ocean wave modeling. I think PAC I use is more than just ocean wave model. <laughs> uh, I would let Martin uh, okay, let's do give an introduction. Phi and I have made yeah. a unanimous decision <laughs> that Martin is going to start. Yeah. I'll give a quick overview for um, PAC IUS, which is the Pacific Regional component of the national IUSs. Okay, but first, let me, just, let me just come in slowly okay. and say this is about the ocean. It is about the ocean. It's about science. It's about examining how the ocean works. Right. Using the best tools and, uh, you know, trying to deliver either predictions or modeling uh, to the public and government so they can make better decisions on how to interface with the ocean. And you're in a great place because we're in Hawaii, surrounded by ocean, with this, you know, enormous intellectual property juggernaut going on there at SOAS. Okay, <laughs> so now you can tell us your part of that. My part is uh, within PAC I use, I do uh, short-term forecasts of inundation, harbor surge, and high sea level, which means that uh, I can predict in the next six days, you know, whether there's going to be deviations from what's expected either climatologically or you know what's happened in the last past week or so so that's uh, it's a it's like a value added forecast that allows people to you know prepare for you know, high run up flooding have uh, harbor currents that may be dangerous or you know conditions that are otherwise you know unknown Okay. That's exactly what I do. So, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we, can I drill down a little oh, bit? We, no, sure. Just hold, yeah. hold a moment. Mm -hmm. We're going to do every. This is very egalitarian. Okay. You'll see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Martin, I mean, so suppose there's a tsunami. Does your science wrap around a tsunami? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. Tsunamis are covered by the Pacific Tsunami <laughs> Warning Center, which is uh, another NOAA component. Tsunamis are generated by either slumps or earthquakes and they're completely separate from anything that we do. Okay, so you're the baseline of the way, the ebb and flow of the ocean. And you're looking, yes. you know, how does it slosh, so to speak? Mm -hmm. uh, are, you, are you counting weather, you know, uh, atmospheric That's conditions? another really good question. Okay. Weather does come into, there, there's actually an atmospheric tide, the tide you know, that we see in the ocean, well, it happens in the atmosphere as well. There's highs and low pressures that come by that will change the sea level. Do you, you crank it in? Is it part of your forecast? We have that as part of our component forecast. So we do a prediction and the weather changes will go into that prediction. And also the weather produces local winds, which is an important component to the wave model that we put in. How old is this science? I mean, is this something you've been around for 50 or 100 years, or is this something more like 10 or 20? This is really recent to be able to do these near-term predictions. It's because it's so uh, stochastic, it's so white, you know, 
It's very, weather and, and climate is, predicting it is just almost impossible because it's so chaotic and so turbulent. Yeah, that's what, you know, so like for example, if I write, if I, as a lawyer, if I write an opinion letter, you know, my opinion is in the first part of the letter. Right. And the next 26 pages is telling you what it doesn't include. What it, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So I have a feeling it's like that here. You know, you can make a, a, a you know, some kind of a prediction. Uh, and they say, well, that's, th my prediction is good as long as all the other things don't happen. And this is it something like that? Um, I think our predictions are a little more accurate than that. But I can't tell you if there's going to be a... Uh, a shift, you know, or like for instance, we're on islands in Hawaii and there's currents that come by these islands. And if there's an eddy that's moving along in the ocean, which changes the sea level, it can come by and the minute it contacts one of the islands, it tends to kind of wrap around it. So the sea level will drop, you know, a little but bit you, faster. You do include uh, the change in sea level we in your forecast it. product. We include it, so but if it happens too that. fast, mm -hmm. we don't, we can't really predict where it's going to come back or where it's leveling out. It does out. sound like the opinion letter. Because, <laughs> you know, things could happen. Uh, say in the next six days, amazing things could happen. Right. And you guys, I, I can't, you know, calculate all of that. I'll just tell you the ebb and the flow and the eddy and the way the water, the, water, the, way the water works in my area of examination. Right. right. And so we've, we've, we've had these running for a couple of years now, and we find that they're you know, they're, they're statistically pretty accurate. But that doesn't mean that I can tell you that for <laughs> sure, six days from now, that's exactly What about surf there. conditions? Can you do surf conditions? That's, there are a lot of people who need you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where our products have combined to be really, um, really interesting. And that we're able to give you run-up conditions, which is, that would be beach safety. And that's something that's never been able to be done before. You know, actually forecasting run-up in, in such an accurate way is really quite unique. So, so tell me if I'm right then. So you're going to handle a certain, a certain part of this whole you know, prognosis, prognostication thing. Um, and then the other guys will handle other parts of it. Um, you know, different factors, different vectors, different influences on the, on the total picture. And then somebody at the end of the day has to talk to all of you and get a composite picture of how all of these things are going to interact with each other. Who's doing that? I think Martin is doing that because we have modelers uh, doing simulation of the ocean currents. I simulate uh, ocean waves and we also have a meteorologist uh, modeling the, the, the weather. So the different pieces of information would go to him and he combined the different pieces of information to produce useful data product, uh, like inundation forecast, yeah. uh, harbor oxygenation. Because okay. in order to predict the inundation forecast, you need to know uh, what is the water level, uh, what is the wave, con what are the wave conditions. So he's kind of like the integrator. Uh, uh, the so you are person. the integrator. Yes. Right. So, uh, but you handle one element, then you integrate all the other elements into, into the pie. We, we, we try and address each kind of societally relevant product as a, as a, in a standalone product. And then the total final integration that would be presented to the public or to an agency would then be done actually, and this is something that's going to be happening in the future. So PacIUS, part of what PacIUS does is develop new products. Now, for instance, 100 years ago, you know, just having an anemometer and, and a sea level gauge at a station was a new product. And then NOAA, eventually the umbrella organization for kind of, you know, what, what ocean and atmospheric sciences get incorporated into kind of governmental things and, and commerce, you know, they take care of that now. So we're, what we're doing is kind of moving forward. We're trying to develop things that may become permanent structures within, you know, no level. But you're you're pushing the envelope. You're doing this you're doing is, science. Yeah, this you're is science. And but it's also available now. You know, yeah. the public can go to our website and and look at these products. Okay. And, you know, in a minute, I want to talk about you know the tools you use. But first, I, I'd like you to tell our listeners how you got where you are. 
How <laughs> <laughs> I got where I went. <laughs> like, personally, where did I, you know, yeah. originate? Well, um, let's see. <laughs> In yeah, undergraduate school, school. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's I the needed a job. I right? <laughs> <laughs> the money ran out. <laughs> um, when I was in undergraduate school, I took theoretical physics, and I had no idea what I really wanted to study. And I was working in Boulder, Colorado, on um, on uh, liquid crystals, nonlinear dynamics of liquid mm -hmm. crystals, and I was in a basically a bunker, two floors underground, <laughs> <laughs> and you have the the flat irons and these wonderful days and hiking trails, and I'm stuck at the basement of this building, staring into a microscope, and I decided I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so I talked to my wife, and we decided that oceanography would be a good good thing. There's nonlinear dynamics in oceanography, and it's fun science, and so. That's Get out of the bunker. Yeah. <laughs> that way, it was literally floor double zero. <laughs> you had to take the elevator down and then down again. So um, that that got me into this kind of you know oceanography. And so for my um, for my PhD work, I worked on uh, on wave wave interactions within the ocean. Oh, so that's my elevator too. Yeah. So it was, oh, you guys uh, have to talk more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> inertial wave interactions interacting with uh, internal tides. So it was very um, kind of a specific subset of, and the, the end result of a lot of what we're studying is trying to track down all the energy that gets put into the ocean. Where does it go? How does it change? Because that's really the accelerator for climate change. Well, it's complicated. It, it is. There's a lot of different components to that. But that's the kind of thing that if we could predict that or we knew a lot more about it, we could give you an idea of how the climate may be changing instead of saying, ah, oh, it's going to be an ice age or, ah, oh, it's going to Oh, be. I want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah see, that's, but that's a different topic. <laughs> okay. Well, so what was, the, what was the title of your dissertation? I mean, roughly. <laughs> oh, it was uh, inertial uh, wave interactions with the semidurnal tide. And, uh, and we focused mostly on data that was collected in, a, in 2000, 2001 in, in a project called HOME. That uh, had had synoptic m vertical measurements of the ocean, so it was, it was a unique data set that allowed us to really kind of. Okay, okay so, so, so are, you, are you teaching also, or just? Uh, no, I don't teach. <laughs> <laughs> I would pity the students that <laughs> take my class. <laughs> okay, let's shift to you. Let's shift to you, guy. A fire, rather. Yes. Um, so, uh, so tell me what you know. What you do, and say in country distinction to the extent you can, uh, with Martin, um, and um, and then how it how it coordinates with what Martin yeah. is doing. Yeah, as I mentioned to you, uh, there are a number of researchers uh, working on the team, uh, working on different aspects of the ocean. Uh, and Martin is kind of uh, the person integrating uh, all the information. You guys are on the same team? Uh, we are on the same project. Yeah, we're on the same project. Yeah, yeah. The uh, same yeah, part so, of, the, of, the, of the... So if you need a complete picture of the of pack I use, uh, probably it would be a PI meeting yeah, uh, like with 20 people because different okay. people would be working on different parts of the project. Okay. Uh, so my part is to simulate the ocean, uh, ocean waves, uh, basically provide one piece of the input to Martin. Uh, right. I operate a global uh, ocean forecast model to provide seven and a half days of forecast ocean conditions uh, around the globe. And near Hawaii, we do high resolution calculation. And we also incorporate uh, the local wind conditions. And to provide uh, the forecast wave conditions near the shore. Right. And then he would take my forecast wave conditions and also the water level data from another researcher to drive his inundation model. So you said seven and a half days, mm -hmm. right. but you're doing six days. So what do you do, forget <laughs> about the day and a half to ignore that? Let's just say that past about four or five days, all of our models <laughs> can be a little bit variable. <laughs> so, so, so we don't like to put confidence into our products past about five days. Mm -hmm. So I go out to six, yeah. you know, so that you can see the beginning. He goes out seven and a half because you know the numerical models can do that easily, mm -hmm. but yeah. they adjust. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so look, at, look at the forecast. Uh, look at the wave forecast, just like the weather forecast uh, right. you get from your news program. So what does a, 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 a weather, a wave forecast look like? I mean, is it just a spreadsheet of data, huge amount of data, oh. where, uh, you know, various characteristics of the waves? 
Uh, is that what it is? We okay, so we okay, so we model the wave mm. conditions over the entire globe. The resolution is half a degree. So every fifty kilometer, uh, there is an open point that you would know the uh, detailed ocean wave conditions that we call a wave spectrum. Meaning that uh, when you look at the ocean, you see waves of different heights coming from different directions with different uh, period. Uh, a spectrum uh, would include all the information, uh, the mix of wave information at a given location for seven and a half days. And we have the information around the entire globe. Uh, so we are talking about a lot of information, a lot more than what you can feed. Uh, uh, but it's all, it's all essentially in a, in a database. Oh yes, in a it's database. A, it's a spreadsheet, various mm -hmm. characteristics. Uh, is, is, is a, a wave, is that like one record and we're going to give it, we're going to assign, uh, rather identify this characteristic and that characteristic and say how fast it's moving, how high it is. Uh, what it's you know what mm -hmm. lots of measurements about so, the yeah. water. So so you you can look at this as a multi-dimensional uh, yeah, spreadsheet yeah. uh, with time with time, time factor time also huge, yeah, yeah uh, also frequency yeah uh, and direction yeah so time this frequency direction uh, location right. height yeah uh -huh. force speed uh, height, height. Uh, for the information we pro okay we provide <laughs> uh, the full information right to Martin. You don't hold anything back. No, uh, we provide the full information, but uh, that would be for the information at specific locations. We provide the full information, but we also provide some integrated quantities or some average conditions over the entire globe. So in that case, we provide the wave height, uh, the wave period, uh, calculated from this multi-dimensional uh, matrix. I love it. I really am learning a lot. I hope you guys are learning something. Too. <laughs> but we're gonna take a break now. We come back. Uh, you know, I want to find out. You know, so many things. First of all, how you got to be where you are. Oh sure. Second of all, what kind of tools you use. Okay. Right? And uh, thirdly, you know, what's the product you deliver? You know, to the public or the government. Okay. Uh, that's Mark Giles. Martin Giles. Martin. Uh, and Martin is the. Uh, senior Physical Oceanographic Research Specialist in SOAS and uh, Kwok Fai Chung, uh, called Fai, mm -hmm. yes. okay, is a professor of ocean and resource engi resources engineering at uh, SOAS. Uh, we'll find out more about him in a minute. Uh, this is Think Tech Talks, the SOAS show on Monday. We're talking about high resolution forecasts uh, with PAC. I use yes, technology. Right. <laughs> okay, be right back after this break. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asia in Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Alalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Hi. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. Well, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel at ThinkTech Talks, the SOAS show on Monday, the School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa with Martin Giles, who is a Norman. That's not because his name is a Norman. He just happens to be a Norman. <laughs> How many Normans do you know? <laughs> okay, and he's a senior uh, physical oceanographic research specialist at SOEST, and Kwok Fai Chung, who's a professor of ocean and resources uh, engineering at SOEST, and they do collaborate about oceans and about high resolution forecasts using PAC IUS technology. Okay, so we, we, we don't want to leave this uh, okay. without catching it. Right? So how did you get where you are exactly, uh, Fai? Uh, it's a long story. Uh, I'm a civil engineer by no, training. Take, take two minutes. Oh, sure, okay. <laughs> uh, and as a civil en in civil engineering, uh, we study many different things. Uh, I was a structural engineer, and then uh, for my PhD, I switched to ocean engineering. Uh, and I focus on uh, ocean wave dynamics, uh, stability of floating platforms, 
uh, after I come to Hawaii, we don't have floating platforms in Hawaii. So I kind of switched Who to... Knows? Uh, well, we might have uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the future. Coming. <laughs> yes. Uh, then uh, I switched uh, to ocean wave, uh, coastal wave processes, like uh, modeling of uh, uh, coastal wave uh, You make it sound like a coastal wave is different from another kind of wave. Uh, it's quite different uh, because okay. in the open ocean, uh, the waves are not influenced by the sea floor. But near the shoreline, uh, how the waves move are influenced by the bathymetry or by the sea floor. So although uh, you look at the ocean, uh, you think uh, the waves are the same, but uh, the physical processes are quite different. And then uh, my research uh, is mostly driven by funding. Uh, so uh, one thing leads to another. Uh, now I'm doing ocean wave modeling. What fun! Mm -hmm. I suppose it all starts with engineering. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> and physics, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's let's go to the tools. So, what kind of tools do you use, you know, to make the forecasts and do the modeling? When you wake up in the morning, what do you turn on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe let me uh, discuss what goes into his model first. Yeah, okay. yeah that's right. a good thing. Uh, and then you will discuss uh, how you will take my information to produce your product. Okay. Uh, I, I operate an uh, ocean wave model. Uh, I need uh, input uh, to drive the ocean wave model. Uh, in the ocean, waves are generated by wind. Okay, uh, and it's the same thing in my model. So what I need would be uh, forecast wind conditions for the next seven and a half days. And I would use the, imp use the wind as input and that would drive my model to, pro to produce the forecast. So operating on the assumption that, that, the, that it's all driven by wind. Uh, yes, and we model the waves that are driven by wind. So for example, if there's a tsunami, uh, my model would not show uh, the tsunami because uh, it is not driven by wind. If so I gave you tsunami data, mm -hmm. could you put it into your model? That would be a different model. Different model? Yeah. You put mm -hmm. both, both models into a third model and now uh, you have the tsunami affected mm -hmm. model? You, you don't look like <laughs> I'm just yes. making this No, 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 no. I think it is, uh, it's good. I, I think it is serious. Uh, people nowadays are talking about uh, interaction between wind waves and tsunami. So what if we have a tsunami at the same time uh, we have a right. big swell? Okay. Uh, yeah, when the swell is. is moving in the opposite direction of the tsunami, yes. what would happen? Yes. Uh, right. So, so uh, I just came back from a meeting in San Francisco. Uh, that was one of the topics of discussion. Uh, how the tsunami would modify uh, the wind waves. Yes. So, so, so. that is a potential topic uh, of research. So, uh, but right now, know, we are not doing it yet. <laughs> yeah. No, not yet. <laughs> so right now, we uh, only, or at least, I also work on tsunamis. Uh, but that would be a different project and perhaps a different talk. Uh, so uh, right now, what we model uh, for pet I use are just wind-generated waves. And that includes well uh, because we model the entire globe. So an, 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 an anemometer. Mm. No, mm -hmm. yeah. so a wind thing. Wind, yeah. mm -hmm. a wind thing. What is a wind thing? How do you measure satellites? That? Oh, satellite measures wind. Yeah, oh yes. Oh, uh, have I been at it? <laughs> so, so, so this is like another story. Uh, <laughs> there's an old there other. <laughs> there is a uh, wind board. There's a model to yeah. generate the wind. Yeah. Uh, based on the pressure distribution and also satellite data, uh, <laughs> that provides seven and a half day forecast of the wind conditions. So that would be also another separate uh, okay. show uh, to talk about <laughs> the wind. So, uh, so we take the wind data uh, from uh, NOAA, uh, yeah. the National Weather Service. They provide seven well, and they half give you all the satellite information? Uh, the the, the data integrated. is coming from, from a model, but uh, they call a simulation, meaning that when they run the model, at the same time when they receive satellite data, they inject the satellite data into the model to make the bot to make the model to do a better job. Okay. So but then you take it out of the model. You take that model. Yeah, I take the wind data uh, from the model and use the data to drive my wave model. Uh, and since we simulate the entire globe, so uh, we also include the effect of swell. Uh, How do you find the swells? 
What's the tool for that? For the scrub? It's the same model because in my model, imagine a, a computer model is like an approximation of reality. So we have wind blowing near Alaska, and my model will show, will pick up the wind energy and generate waves, and the waves will propagate across the ocean and get to Hawaii, and it becomes swell. So in the meantime, if we have trade winds blowing from the northeast, yeah. my model would pick up the local trade winds. Yeah. So what you will see from the output would be a mix between the swell and trade winds. Just like what you see in and the also ocean. the coastline. Oh, yes. And the, and the, the whole dimension, the whole characteristic of the coastline. Yeah, yeah. How, how it comes up on the beach and uh, that what kind of so. formations. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. oh, that's what Martin does. Yeah. So, so in my case, I do the calculation up to maybe 20 meter water depth. Yeah, they are 200, right? 200, okay, so so I, I do the calculation all the way to the coastline, but he take my output at the 200 meter yeah. uh, water depth, and then feed the information to his model. Over to you, Martin, kind of thing. Uh, yeah, uh, but because in my case, my model is a global model. Uh, it doesn't have the high resolution uh, yeah. to resolve the coastline. Okay, and you're getting your data from NOAA or from Sat originally from satellites? Officially from NOAA. No, uh, both on, on the swells and on the wind? Uh, just the wind. Just the wind. Just the wind. Uh, and the. You, you it don't is have a little data. gizmo out there, right? <laughs> no. You have a little ship that says uh, so west on the side, you know, and it oh. has you know, sensors in the water measuring. Uh, nothing like that. We have yes, a, I think we, we have, have a wave. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Okay. so we do. Uh, we don't just do the calculation. Uh, we try to validate our model output with buoy measurements, uh, also with uh, ship, ship measurements uh, of the ocean conditions. Okay, let's go. To, let's go to Martin. Martin, mm -hmm. what tools do you have? I mean, you're taking you know uh, Phi's uh, models, and you're putting other information in. What, what aside from Phi's models, so, what else do you get? The first thing that we do when we develop one of these products is we do. Uh, uh, a, a reanalysis. You call it a product. Yeah. A product is an information product. Yeah. That's Great. so. The language of the business. The kind of <laughs> yeah. Pack use is is um, even though it's done in the at the academic level, it's um, its focus is towards providing for the the community, you know, at large, so government agency stuff like that. Instead of us just doing pure research. So you have to be very conscious about what they need out there. Exactly. To figure yeah. out what they want, what they need, what they're going to do with it, and all that. Right. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a kind of business speak aspect. You're too. the outreach guy. I'm not the outreach guy, <laughs> but I do have to be very um, specific in the language I use to describe what we're doing. Because I can't just say, oh, you know, this is extreme or this is something to look out for. I mean, that's <laughs> newspaper not, will pick that up. Exactly. <laughs> that's not our purview. We need to let other agencies do that. We're not a we're not the buffer to the public. Right. Even though this is all publicly available, yeah. which yeah. is kind of right. puts but us somebody in has to explain it to the public. Exactly. So nobody gets pedicure or anything. Right. So, so he called his data product yeah. because he's the person to provide information in a way that can be used by the public. Yeah. So for me, I call my data just data. Data. Yeah. And I just give you my data. And it's I further make, away. Uh, exactly. He's, he's a little safer. <laughs> like, like the back, back office. Uh, help us. Safe. <laughs> Safe. Yeah. So, what, what, so to develop one of these, I, first we do a, a reanalysis of sea level. So basically, one of the products that, not products, one of the techniques we developed when we first started this was a, a, a new title analysis software. So we actually generated new title analysis software, which is uh, extremely accurate. So we kind of pushed the envelope scientifically in, in, in doing title analysis. And then we uh, developed the sea level product. So I take my own sea level uh, product and couple that together with the wave forecast and then we put that into a very, um, it's super complicated, and yet the end result is just one simple number. <laughs> so there's three different types of, um, of water levels that get pushed up onto what we call run-up. So, and that's the ultimate information, the run-up. Yeah. Run-up on the beach, okay. So run-up is, um, it's the product we deliver is called a two percent exceedance product. So if you had a hundred sets come in, you know, maybe two of those would would run up the beach. So we're going to try and predict that highest 
level of run up, you know, given a couple hours or something like that. Can you predict the sets too? No, no that's that's a yeah, that's not within well, our I mean, scope. Surfing would be a whole new thing if you could. That would be very cool. Okay, this is. <laughs> This is set number six SJ seven. <laughs> See, we can get We're close. I mean, his, the model is uh -huh. is is now performing really, really, really well. Yeah. So it's it's it. We can tell you, you know, what kind of conditions you're going to be looking at. But predicting the set, the actual individual waves themselves. See, each single wave has phase information that we don't preserve. Mm -hmm. So that's the tricky bit. So I don't think it's coming, though. It's coming. Uh, so. I don't know. That would be uh, maybe you need some supercomputers there. App, you know. Oh. What is that man standing <laughs> on the beach with the little app? He's tell and he's telling the surfers. <laughs> now, that's a good point you brought that up, because as everyone would like to know, PacIOS has developed a mobile version of their oh. website. <laughs> so you can go and look at our cool. products mm -hmm. on your yeah. phone. And uh, the, the run-up products on the second page we do provide the uh, full spectral uh, view of both the model and what the wave buoy is doing. So if you're a smart surfer and you understand what's happening with periods and how things are generating with swell that's coming in, you can go to our page and get more information than you get anywhere else. And it won't cost you anything either. It's free. <laughs> Fabulous. The government's paying, yeah, but, hopefully, but, for you us. Know, <laughs> so I think what people have to understand is that you're getting the data from various sources, I mean, collectively, cumulatively. You're analyzing them, and at the end of the day, it's a matter of building the uh, algorithms by which you analyze these things, building the software. It's a software game at the end of the day yeah. to find out what you really need and how you interpret all this data into that software. And that's the science of it. So, you guys programmers? Python, MATLAB, C, C++, Bash, you know, I have script my language. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I, used, uh, yeah, I used to consider myself a programmer. Uh, but nowadays, I spend all my time doing budget and proposal. <laughs> He's got some postdocs that do that. <laughs> I'm talking about that in the third year. It's, it's Martin Giles and Kwok Fai Chung, both of SOWEST, um, just to be specific. Um, Martin is a senior physical ocean oceanographic research specialist within SOWEST, and Kwok Fai Chung is a professor of ocean and resources engineering, and they're working on high resolution forecasts and modeling, which is very interesting, happening right here, right here in Hawaii at Manoa. Fabulous, great careers actually. Uh, this is Think Tech Talks. The SOWEST show will be right back after this short break. to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. Uh, we're back, we're live, we're here at Think Tech Talks, the SOAS show on a given Monday, talking about high resolution forecasts uh, with PAC IUS technology uh, with Martin Giles and Kwok Fai Chung at SOAS. So, uh, I guess the next question is uh, you know, you, you paint a picture of something really sophisticated, which understands our environment better than ever, really and which has all the prospects of uh, answering lots and lots of questions about how it works in Hawaii. But what are, the, um, what are the problems? I mean, what do you need to go to the next step on this? What do you need to get out there and answer anybody's question about anything to understand the ocean in a way that, you know, that is completely authoritative and, and uh, forecasts that, that go for 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a hundred days. You know. Oh, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> That's a. So what do we what do we need? What are the barriers and what are the challenges? Money. Yeah, we need money. Okay. Money's good. For me, uh, I need a bigger computer, uh, and also an intro of the power supply, because the calculations take about twenty four hours. So if uh, there is power outage uh, in the middle of the calculation, uh, I will miss the forecast, and then oh, I will receive uh, a couple of uh, angry email from. <laughs> <laughs> from London. How long does it take to do one of these calculations? Uh, almost twenty-four hours for the entire suite of calculations. Yeah. So uh, and as you know, uh, this time of the year, the power supply is not uh, that. Steady. It's I mean, once oh, in a you while. Mean the electrical. We have, yeah, yeah, the yeah, 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 the grid yeah, and all yeah. that. Okay. So uh, and uh, 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 just an inch of uh, 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 power supply uh, would be kind of the key uh, to provide timely forecast, because we are almost uh, operation. I think. Do you consider operate ourselves operational? Yeah, we're, I think we're really we're close. Not, yeah, so operational means. We have to put out the data at a certain time. Other people are relying on us. Sure. Okay. It's all part of a process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, and if there's a power outage, uh, uh, I could not finish my calculation. Martin would not get my data, so you would not see the data product. So if this technology is available. All you have to have is money to buy it. Uh, yeah. Okay, that right. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so, there's this uh, 400 million dollar backlog of infrastructure for e-waste. <laughs> <laughs> right. where, where does this fit? On the yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. think so, it's a big enough. So. <laughs> Unfortunately. Or the other way would be to do the calculation faster. Yeah, so if we do the calculation faster, uh, then the chance of getting interrupted by a uh, power outage what would be less. What big computer are we talking about? <laughs> this, is, this isn't like a, a, a MacBook Pro, is it? No. 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 Uh, okay. How many cores do you run now? We have a computer cluster. Uh, we are using six nodes. Uh, so each node eight has 16. 16 processors. So we are talking about uh, 96 uh, computers 96 or 96 cores. PCs uh, linked together. Oh, you have to link them. They don't come yeah. that big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so just an uh, just. As an analogy, uh, the computing power that we need is equivalent to about 100 PCs, yeah. uh, the best available PCs. But uh, if you look at the actual computer we use, uh, it's nothing bigger than a box. So Not big enough. <laughs> so, uh, so if we have more, I think if we have more computing power, we do the calculations faster. Uh, then I, I think that would be uh, more reliable. What else you mentioned in the break? Maybe some programmers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he need an assistant. <laughs> it would it would be very nice to have a programmer, but uh, I but think you are the programmer. I, yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> I'm a scientist yeah. and I'm also the programmer. So. Yeah, right. I mean, wouldn't it be better to have the, the separation there between the scientist and the programmer? Yeah, it would. Mm -hmm. Mainly because um, you know the the expertise somebody gets when they. Go, go through a CS computer science degree means that they already know these you know how to make code redundant how to make it not break you know how to you know so it, I spend quite a bit of time going back and looking at my code that is broken and <laughs> fixing it you know but that that's all right because I we you know we're, we're building kind of the um, computational engine underneath so I don't have to do a lot of you know how does this look on the web or how you know so the scientific part is, is, you know, we do need to be programmers in that sense. So, but at least to supervise programming, you, you have to know you have to know programming yeah, to supervise programming. Exactly. Otherwise, you get lost. Yeah. yeah. So, for our products, though, what would be um, like what would be the future or what's the problem? Uh, one of the problems for these nearshore environments is that we don't have synoptic data. There's what not synoptic. Mean, that means you have a full view of uh, of you know a, a, a region. So we don't have a lot of data sets that have, you know, let's say a grid of pressure sensors all along the coastline, you know, showing how the waves came in and what those structures all look like. Big bucks. That's a that's a full on project, you know. That's yeah. you know, uh -huh. and that would be the kind of thing where it would validate 
the wave models. It would allow us to look at you know, different types of waves that are underneath. You, you know, mean the, actual measurements? Uh, yeah, the yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it is something we need. Uh, we do a lot of calculation. Uh, computers are fast, and uh, we put a lot of data uh, on the internet. But how much confidence do we have in the data? You so need that's another sort of question. That real world pushback yeah, yeah. thing yeah. With, uh, with sensors and the mm -hmm. like. And right now near Hawaii, I validate my model data at maybe six or seven locations, uh, but they are all in deep water. Yep. So it would be very useful uh, if we have instrument That's near the, the shoreline where you produce your data product. Yep. Uh, then we can compare the forecast uh, with uh, the actual measurements. And then we have an idea how good the data is or how good your data product is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you also, a pretty good cage yeah. for yeah. I mean, I'm ready to get my checkbook out. Okay. I'll make it even better because <laughs> the product that I put out right now is specific for certain types of beaches because it's the only place we've done these experiments. Yeah. We haven't done them in all, all these beach conditions, all these different places. So if we had kind of a, 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 a better field program to quantify what these other really near shore beaches do and how they respond to the waves mm -hmm. then we could take what we call it extensibility we want our products eventually like because he's running the same wave model in other areas in the pacific oh yeah mm -hmm. You know, so this so isn't just be, uh, limited to Hawaii. This is this is something that we could models if, we could put anywhere. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You put in a yeah. wave buoy, you sh you give me his data, yeah. and I have a tide gauge, yeah. and then all of a sudden I can show you inundation products. I can give you stuff like that throughout the whole yeah. region. So. Well, when Chip Fletcher talks about you know how he comes up with these maps, you know, it shows you the beaches eroding. Right. Is, is your data involved in that? I mean, is your data relevant to that to determining? How, how climate change is going to eat the beaches? Um, there's, it, it is, but it's in the sense that um, there's a frequency of events, you know, based on how many high sea level events you see over time. So it's, you know, it's it's you don't want to be um, you don't want to be alarmist in one sense, but for places where you know the sea level rise is increasing you know the tide the high tide happens you know once or twice a day right well if the sea level is going up then the times that the high tide exceeds a level where the inundation is going to occur that means they're going to have more and more inundation every year you know as time goes by and your so data will show our tidal analysis gives a little bit better accuracy for predicting which areas are going to have how much more inundation in a relative sense yeah the area against area yeah yeah but so, but I mean, it sounds to me like this. Am I right? This whole examination, this whole area of science modeling and forecasting, is something that has been, uh, you know, encouraged, incentivized by the whole notion of sea change, uh, climate change, right? That is it becomes one more important yeah. mm -hmm. with that. Right? Yeah. So I think uh, going back to your question about Chip Fletcher's data, and I do see some potential research uh, using the data. Uh, he gathered shoreline data for the last maybe 10, 15 years. Right. And we can go back to do the calculation of the wave conditions uh, during the same period and try to find a pattern between the ocean wave conditions and the change of the shoreline. Okay, to find a relation between the two, uh, uh, the two parameters. And then if we know how the ocean wave conditions are going to be in the future, then we can use the information to project how the shoreline will respond right. uh, to the ocean, ocean environment. So, so you, you, can, do you have can get a, a really mm -hmm. accurate uh, forecast over time of how exactly the shoreline, uh -huh. you know? We can give a, 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 a accurate um, quantification of what mm -hmm. to expect, yeah. mm -hmm. but we can't yeah. tell you like when mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Now, now, but you're, you're not dealing on the macro level, you know, like, like the amount of carbon in the atmosphere um, you're not dealing on the melting of the polar caps or anything like that. Um, you're just dealing on the way the waves work, yeah. the way the wind works. But, but that, that is, since you bring this up, that is a potential research project because there are climate models that forecast what the globe would look like for the next 100 years. So the climate model right. includes simulation of the wind for the next 100 years. 
And remember, all I need to drive my model would be the winds. Yeah. So cool. I can put the winds uh, from the climate forecast model into, um, into my wave model, and I can calculate uh, what the ocean waves would look like for the next 100 years. Right. And there's a lot of information uh, uh, for engineers, for planners. How about investors? <laughs> and also insurance now, companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the big ones, the insurance companies, yeah, you know, yeah. they really want to know. Oh, they want to know if there's going to be damage yeah, in yeah, a given yeah, exactly. area. For That's yeah, yeah, because, billion, billion, yeah, billion the, dollar. The past, practice, the past practice is to look at, let's say, the ocean wave conditions right. of the last 30 years and put the information in a statistical model to project what it would look like for a 100 year period. Okay, but uh, now the future is going to be different. We cannot predict the future using the past. So we would have this to use, yeah, we will right. have to use the forecast data uh, for the next 100 years to develop a data set that people can use to plan for the future. And I know the insurance industry is already using this technique. They're already doing oh, it. Oh yeah, for their loss estimation, uh, they are not looking into the past. So when I, if I have a beachfront property and I put it in for insurance, they, they have data, they can make a, some calculated judgment about, about uh, what, what my problem is going to be 30 years away. Yeah. That's pretty good. So <clears throat> there's going to be an intersection though, because then you guys are you're pushing it on, on the science level here and you're sort of coming together and it's, it's ripening, maturing in terms mm -hmm. of the science and the, the product, as you said, Martin. But where, where is it going to wind up? Where is it going to be most valuable? Where are people going to be most hungry to have this data? Is it going to be in, as we say, the insurance and climate change and, and beach uh, run up and erosion? Or is it going to be uh, in, in something else? Uh, uh, as 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 the world changes, you know, uh, there's all these vectors coming together, and you're you're one or some of those vectors. But where where do you think it's going to go? My, I it's think it's not an easy question. The, the, <laughs> for me, the, that's why I think to look at our products and and try and from the get go when I'm designing how these should work and look and what the underlying. Uh, you know, data analysis is to try and make them extensible. And by that, I mean that they can be applied at other areas that maybe I didn't observe directly, but I'm, I'm inferring what's going to happen in those areas. Then I think that, that for instance, like the run-up tool becomes very, very um, useful. Someone else, you know, in Dubai can predict what's going to happen in the beaches if the sea level is extraneous. When you say extensible, do you mean extensible to other islands? Islands, uh, coastlines. continental uh, shorelines? I, I think, the, okay. Well, there's very, it, the, the product depends directly on the very uh, nearby topography. So, so if I go two kilometers down the beach, I may not see the same so type of So let me put up. it this way. The model that he used it, it, is empirical. What we call empirical, this means it is scalable for a specific location. So if you want to take your model to another location, yeah. you would have to recalibrate the whole thing. Yeah. So the model is not physics-based. Yeah. So that's the reason why uh, Martin uh, has been talking about getting measurements uh, for model calibration. So versus uh, what I use is physics-based model, meaning that uh, the model has physics in it, or not the full physics, but at least uh, physics. I'm sorry, physics. Physics. Uh, oh, physics. physics. Yeah, okay. the physics in the model would tell me what the ocean wave condition would look like. So I don't need to rely on calibration of the model for the local conditions. Right. So ultimately, it would be extensible anywhere, everywhere. I mean, that's what yeah. you don't want to have to go get new empirical studies on no, every location. That's, uh, that would be, able be... To snap the information in for every location. It would be very expensive to have to calibrate every single yeah. beach that you but, wanted to uh, use it uh, in. Uh, I think that is what you are doing now. Yeah, what we're, we're doing now is taking all the mm -hmm. all the data that has been done over the last, you know, about seven or eight years at various beaches and, and uh, trying to give a good estimate of different beach types on the North Shore. We're going to try and uh, bring out a, a new product that covers the whole North Shore. 
which is going to be well cool. in an island state we really really need, need everything you can do for us especially at a time of great change where we we're the objects of change that starts elsewhere and what do we know so Suffrage well you guys uh, let me get back to you asked like uh where would this be very impactful so right now one of the areas where we would like to see um, this thing happen, but it's very hard to do, would be in, in the marshals. Because obviously sea level impacts that type of community a lot more severely than us. Yeah. I mean, our shoreline might change, but their whole eighth hole could disappear. Yeah. And the run-up conditions in an eighth hole, though, rely on circulation, rely on atmospherics, relies on the wave conditions, relies on the beach slope, the reef structure, all these things. So being able to provide the same kind of uh, resource for that is, you know, that's one of the things we'd like to be able to do, but it requires more experimentation, more funding, more programmers. You know? Okay, well, what's the future of, uh, of SOAS? I mean, SOAS efforts in this area. Where, where is it going to go? Give me a five-year snapshot. What did your grandma uh, think? <laughs> well, I think we will continue to provide uh, the forecast for yes. the next five years. In fact, I believe uh, the management team is already putting together a proposal mm. uh, to get funding uh, from NOAA for another five years. So public support will be very helpful. <laughs> one, one last question, and maybe mm -hmm. I'm a little off track, but I just wondered, in, in an island state, where you have different, uh, you know, coastal, coastal um, structures and uh, different uh, 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 different configurations and um, dynamics of the waves meeting in the middle of the channel and all that. Could your science help navigation? Could your science help the captain of a ship who travels inter-island uh, find the smoothest route? from A to B? I think we already have the data. Yeah. So we simulate the uh, ocean wave conditions yeah. at high resolution around the Hawaiian Islands. So uh, we have seven and a half day forecast of the data. So if you want to sail from Hilo to Honolulu, right. uh, all you need would be uh, internet access. Uh, you can look at our data and then you can identify the locations that are most exposed uh, to the ocean wave conditions. Wow, uh, that's fabulous. Yep, so yep. you can actually do that. Uh, let me get my checkbook out and right after the program. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, if you're next to one of the cities, you can just get your cell phone app and use our new mobile app yeah. and bring up the wave conditions. <laughs> Another way of doing it, all right. It's uh, Martin Giles and uh, Kwok Fai Chung. Uh, Martin is the uh, Senior Physical Oceanographic Research Specialist, and Kwok Fai Chung is the Professor of Ocean and Resource um, um, Engineering. Yes. Still got it right. Mm -hmm. on, on the SOAS show here today, we're talking about high-resolution forecast with uh, PAC uh, IUS, which is Integrated Ocean uh, Observing Systems. And we're talking about ocean wage, wave uh, modeling and all kinds of projections and modeling, and I learned a lot. I hope you guys did, too. Thank you very much, everyone, you guys. Paul okay. Martin. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. It is fun. <laughs>